goodness, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Glad you are here. And you know what? I love what Scripture says. This is the day that the Lord has made. And I don't know about you, but I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Yes, give the Lord some praise in the house this morning. Amen. Let's stand to our feet this morning. We don't have any announcements this morning for you at this point in time. We're going to go ahead and invite the presence of the Lord into this place because we do not want to do anything without the leadership of the Holy Spirit in this place. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we are so thankful. Father God, you have called us to this place today. Lord, it's a special day because it's the day you have made. So Lord, let us now keep our hearts, our mind focused upon you. Lord, I pray that, Father, you would touch us right now, that, Father God, we would be ready to worship you, to receive of you, forget everything around us, Lord and learn of you. So, Father God, now we offer you up our praise. We are so thankful for who you are. In your sweet name, we ask these things. Amen. As we was getting ready for church this morning, the Lord just spoke one simple phrase to me. Do this in remembrance of me. I thought about that on my way to church this morning. I thought about it as we was preparing to get ready this morning. And you know, we think about that. We think about taking communion. That's, that's the first thing we think about. But if you read that scripture, he said, as you take and you drink of this body, you, you, you break this body, you take this blood and you drink of it. Remember me as you do it. But what are we saying when we ask the Lord? Lord, let me receive of you. When we take of that blood, we partake of that body. That ain't just when we take communion. That's when we stand in the presence of the Lord and we allow his holy presence to come down upon us. When we ask him to come into our lives, that blood came in and it washed the sins white as snow. So this morning, I don't know what you came to do this morning, but I ask you within your spirit to look upon the Lord and remember the things that he's done for you today. Remember where he's brought you from. Remember where he's going to take you to. There's more in just remembrance than taking to the communion of the body of the Lord. So this morning, I ask you to remember him and you offer up him a praise because he's worthy. Let's sing this morning. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 There's no
you see? What is it that you're working for? This is a song about the vision, the declaration, and the promise of the returning of a soon coming king. If you can't get hold of it, church, somebody in here can see it. Won't you see? Won't you worship and testify like you know it to be true? And when we get to that point where you declare, there's no God like Jehovah, would you let somebody know that that's your vision, that's your declaration? I've seen it. I know it. I believe it because it's true. Come on, let's worship. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Bible tells me that the Son of God is seated on the right hand of the Father. You know, last week we talked about it just for a brief moment about how the Lord's ready to come. One day he's going to split those eastern skies. But you know, the Bible says that all he's sitting there waiting on is the Father to say, go bring my children home. And when I think about him, riding that horse, coming back to take us home. Can you see that? Can you see that in your mind? Can you see that in your soul? The Lord's sitting there preparing to come to take you home. Hallelujah. And I don't know, I feel like the Lord's ready to do something here today. But I'm going to tell you something. It's up to me and you this morning. Oh, we go back to what Brother Lawrence was talking about the other night. About the fields are ready, but the laborers are few. Church, I want him to find me and I want him to find you lifting him up this morning. I want you to pour it all out to the Lord this morning because he's worthy. Come on, it's up to us. Let's say, I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me and all my days. I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up oh, Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good. You have led me to the fire, and in 
Oh, really be moved by the presence of his, of his holy, all oh, his holy presence. Oh, thank you, God. God, I thank you for each and every person that you brought into this house today. Some of us just full of experiences and testimonies of how you've moved time and time again. Lord, I'm believing that there are also others, God, all that are seeking after that very kind of testimony, those that are needing that very kind of fellowship where they know, God, that every place they walk, God, it's with you. That they know with full assurance, God, that you go before them to make a way. Oh, God, that your mercies, oh, God, your goodness does follow them every day. So, God, help us, Lord. Help us to be very present in this time with you. Help us to be very present and aware, God, that this is all for you, God. Some of us already know in your soul. Some of us seeking to find you. But the wonderful thing is, you are here for all and you always will be. Oh, let those with a testimony of faith worship and witness right now. Oh, can you feel that touch? Can you feel that presence just drawing in closer? Oh, we preach. I will sing of your goodness. I will sing of your love. Of the seasons come quickly. You have always been in love. Though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love. You are good. In the morning I'll sing you are good. In the evening I'll sing you Oh, what a friend of mine. So I'll remind myself. 
together. Father, we just ask you right now to be with all of our local churches and pastors and evangelists and whatever's going on in your name today in their community and throughout their nation and world. Let it, let the anointing of the Holy Ghost just saturate it. Let us walk out of here saturated, dripping in the anointing that your word, your presence has for us today. Father, we ask you to touch all those who've joined in online and Father, those who are here right now, our Sunday school, Father, we thankful for every volunteer that teaches their children that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that he's the closest friend that you'll ever have in this life. Now, Father, let everything be done out of this pulpit, be done in the anointing of your spirit. Father, I surrender. If I have failed you in any way, forgive me. Not just only forgive me, show me how to walk those paths of righteousness and holiness and truth. Father, let us do it humbly, but yet boldly, knowing it's through the Holy Spirit we have strength from day to day. Now, Father, we are thankful. We give you praise in all things. And in Jesus' holy, most precious name, we all agree and we say, Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Thank you, guys. Sunday school is dismissed. Those who are going to Sunday school, give those kids a hand for being in church today. Amen. Praise God. Good to see everybody in the house. Some of y'all may be here by accident. The wind just blew you in. Uh, that's because we were praying for you. God to bring you to church. Uh, it's, it's so amazing on days like today to watch all the, the folks who spend a lot of time on their hair. Just watch it go. Just watch it absolutely go. Um, Mine, it just blew out. It was just, uh, you could see it. I got to church, and I tried to get out of my door, and I couldn't get out. I was like, I thought somebody was pranking me. I actually thought Chris Woodard had snuck out and was at the bottom of the door trying to hold my door in. But it was just the wind. It's been strong out there. So uh, glad that you made it. Glad that you're safe. Glad that you're here. You got your Bibles. Go to John chapter 10, verse number 10. John chapter 10, verse number 10. The title of this morning's message is, What Do You Attract? What's attracted to you? I was pumping gas the other day. Mike, if you will, get that picture on for me. I was pumping gas the other day at a gas station, and I noticed across right from where I was standing, there were two dead trees. And there was a lot of live trees around it, but there were two dead trees. 
And I looked in those trees as I was looking down, and as you can see, those are buzzards. Out of all the trees they could have picked, they picked the dead ones. Well, there's a reason for that. Buzzards love death. The Lord spoke to me this word, dead things attract things that like dead things. Amen. Dead things attract things that like dead things. So it asks my question to myself, what do you attract? What do your words attract? What do your thoughts attract? What do your actions attract? You can say, well, it seems like everybody around me are just gospelers. Well, Man, it just seems like the people I always come to me are broken. Well, I'm going to tell you something I did not too long ago. Well, it was on my birthday. Me and Jensen had the same birthday, and one of the things we wanted to do is go to the Rage Room. If you've never been to the Rage Room in Bristol, I recommend it. You get to go in a room, you put some coveralls on, you put a face shield on, and they give you a bat. They give you 30 items of glass to break. They give you two big televisions to break. And what you do is you just go in there and you just wear it out. And they gave me my bat. It's like, I'm so ready for this. I am so ready for this. The man says, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> uh, and he's like, okay. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But we went in there and Lord, how mercy I put glasses up, vases up, and I'd just swing and glass would shatter. They actually have a place, the corner, one of the corners is made of metal to where even if you don't want to use a bat, you just want to sling something. Now y'all can judge me if you want to, but y'all know y'all fight those feelings inside. And I figured why not do it at a place where they say you can do it. But it hit me today, maybe that room is so attractive to people because when you're broken, you like to hear broken things, right? Maybe that's one of the reasons that it's hard to even make an appointment there because we all have frustration. So what attracts us? Not only do what do you attract, what are you attracted to? Where do you go to when things go bad? What, what, what part of your life not only is attractive, but what do you attract? And what attracts you? The Bible says in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have, somebody shout it out, life, life and that they may have it abundantly. Jesus says there's two people here. There's two personas. One's the devil, of course, and the other is him. Jesus says, I want to attract life. I want to attract life. People who want life. People who want out of darkness. People, want, uh, but, but the devil attracts destruction. He, 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 he attracts people who thieve or, or steal or kill or, or, or anger or, or whatever it might be. He said, one or the other you are attracted to. And whoever you're attracted to, that's what you will attract. Now, the very first thing that came to my mind, somebody say this with me, your words. Go to Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21. What do your words attract? What kind of people do your words attract? What kind of situations does your words attract? How do you speak? What do you say? The Bible even says this, that in the last day or when the day comes of judgment, that we will give an account for every idle word that we have spoken. Words are important. But who do you attract with words? Does anybody remember when you were in school and you knew what some kids liked so you would talk that so you could attract them? Maybe they'd like you and to fit in. And, and a lot of times we use their words to attract things. And then also sometimes people use their words that attract us. Do me a favor and go to the grocery store. Say it loud. Does anybody want to hear what God has done for me? And you watch buggies going by you. 
Now go to the same store and go, do you want to hear about my neighbor and what she got caught in last night and watch them swarm to you like bees to honey? Words, they attract. What do your words attract? And I don't mean just in public places. What does your words attract? Are they attractive to Jesus? Is Jesus attracted to your mouth because of the words that you speak? Or does the enemy just wait for you to open your mouth? Because he's attracted to what you're going to say next. Proverbs 18, 21 says this. Death, this is serious. Please don't take this as a quote or something nice. This is truth. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. I like how James says it. James says, how can we bless God with one mouth and curse man with another? For do we not know that man was made in the image of God? How can we then curse man and bless God? This not ought to be. How can pure water and salt water come out of the same fountain? <laughs> Y'all be like, I should have got an amen for this one before we started because they probably won't be rushing up here. But can I tell you, maybe, maybe you know, I hear people say, well, everything's falling apart for the church. Well, what are we talking like? Do, do, do we attract people who need hope? Do we attract people who need salvation? Or do we, with same mouse, be one thing one place and somewhere different another? And we're all guilty of it. Let's, let's not... Let's not scan the crowd and go, I wonder, uh, we're all doing it. You're flesh. And can I tell you something about the flesh? You can't stop the flesh from being fleshy. You can stop the desire of the flesh. Does anybody know the Bible didn't tell you that you're not supposed to be flesh? He said, stop the desire of the flesh by walking in the spirit. Amen? So we all have that flesh moment, that fleshy moment, and we've done it. And guess what? We attract it as soon as we spoke. And when we attract it, what's attractive? When you talk, what do you attract? And I don't mean in the natural, in the supernatural. What do, you, what do you attract when you talk? Your words that come out of your mouth. What kind of fruit does people eat from that? I want you to go to John 6, 6, 8. John chapter 6, verses 68. Because to me, the greatest example of, of, of someone that attracted was Jesus. Now, the Bible plainly tells us that he was not an attractive man. He was homely. He was ugly. Wasn't much about him that we should desire him. Amen? But yet, thousands of people would follow him. Thousands of people would leave their house. In fact, 12 of them left their careers. Left everything that they've ever known to follow this man. But now Jesus has spoke some words. And the words were, as Chris even said it earlier, you're going to have to eat my flesh, drink my blood. You're going to have to follow me. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to forget about you. And you're going to have to follow me. And 70, what they said, disciples left. And Jesus looks to the 12 and he looks to Peter and he says, are you going to go too? What are you attracted to? You only attracted to, to, to this or that? Or, and, and this is what Peter says. Peter says this. Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. He said, there ain't no way. I'm attracted to your word. I'm attracted to life. I've, I've lived death. I've seen death. I've been a part of it. But now that I've heard you speak, where else can I go? And not only did that happen to Peter, not only was Peter attracted to the words that came out of Jesus' mouth, but in Acts chapter 2, it says Peter got up and preached a message and 3,000 souls were saved because not only did he believe Believe what Jesus said. He believed it so much that he spoke it again. Repent and be baptized. That all come from words. People are attracted to that. What do you attract with your words? What do you say that attracts things into your life? It's amazing. We can wake up in the morning, have two bad things happen by 10 o'clock, and we've already said, well, it's going to be one of those days. 
Well, guess what? You attracted one of those days already. They were waiting for you. I mean, no, there should be enough faith rise up and say, you know what? Two bad things happen. <laughs> you know what? I've already started this morning off rough. But my God is with me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. And no matter what happens the rest of the day, I am blessed. I am favored. I am, oh, glory to God. I, I, I walk in salvation. I walk with the Spirit. And guess what? That's what you will attract. I've done it. Anybody ever have a bad day and say, it's going to be one of those days? Come on now. Let's talk about Monday. How many's already cursed Monday? <sighs> it's hard to enjoy a Sunday when I know a Monday's coming. Well, that's what you attracted. What you speak is found in your mouth. Life or death is in thy tongue. I love what James also says. It says the tongue is the most deadly poison. I got to do something a couple nights ago. Found a tape of my dad preaching. And my dad's been gone 31 years and you tend to forget what they look like. Forget what he sounds like. So I was on cloud nine. And I put this thing in. And Trace is like, wow, he was a fireball. Because, I mean, he's jumping all over the place. He's all over the place. And, and one thing that he said that I called, he said, when you get saved, it don't have to be a long prayer. Because if Peter would have spoke three more words, he'd have set him underwater. He said, all he had to say is, Lord, save me. And it attracted Jesus. Amen. He's like, he's like, if Peter would have been long-winded, he'd have drowned. And I won't forget that. That stuck out to me because I thought that's exactly right. Think about it. Do your words attract Jesus? And does Jesus' words attract you? Where else can I go? Only you have the words of life. Only you have what I want to hear. Only you speak to my soul, my mind, my body. Let me say this, and please, please know this. And I want you to remember this real good. Your words either bury or plant. In other words, your mouth is either a cemetery or a garden. I went to college for a semester. Go ahead and laugh. Just a semester. After I found out you did not need an excuse from mommy when you missed a day, I missed a lot. <laughs> Told mom I was going to school, ended up at Claypool Hill Mall when it was a mall in the arcade playing NBA Jam. That's where I was during the counting class. But, 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 but to have a future in education, I had to go to the college and get my classes. I didn't go to the funeral home. Because see, the funeral home is not the place to plan your life, the place to plan your death. So when I wanted to further life in the next step of life, I didn't go there. Anybody get that? Because see, again, what you are is what's attractive. That's the reason when we go shopping, we're more excited about going somewhere we can pick out a new suit or dress than we are a casket. I'm going shopping today. Let's go to the funeral home. Yay. I heard they got a new setting in. You seen the 2023 models? Whoa, they look good. You don't hear people say that. But when we talk about life, is it attractive? Are your words either a garden or a cemetery? Number two, your thoughts. Proverbs chapter 23 and 7. What do your thoughts attract? Does anybody have one thought lead to another thought to another thought? And then the next thing you know, you're down this rabbit hole thinking things that you didn't even think about. What are your thoughts? Now, I'm going to say this right now. I'm not here telling you that you'll never have a bad thought. But I am telling you how long it stays is up to you. Amen? I'm not telling you you're never going to have a bad thought go across your mind. I'm not telling you that, that, that something that, that you want to say will not go across your mind and say, I want to say, but how long it stays is up to you. Because we're all going to have thoughts. 
We're going to have things that we think about that we shouldn't, but how long it stays is up to us. The Bible says this. For as he thinketh in his heart. What? Let's see. Eat and drink, saith he to thee. But his heart, not with thee. So if his heart's not with thee, that means he ain't thinking nothing of you. Right? Can I tell you, we spend more time trying to impress people who ain't thinking nothing about you. The Bible says God has thoughts towards you. And what do they attract? What does God's thoughts about you attract? My thoughts are good and not evil. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you something good. So God's thoughts attract good things. What are your thoughts attract? When you think about church, what do your thoughts attract? When you think about your family, what does your thoughts attract? I can tell you one time in my life, my thoughts only attracted death because that's what my thoughts were about 24-7. How can I leave this place? How can I get out? How, how, can, how can I make something different? That, that was my thought process. And guess what? That's what my thoughts attracted. And guess what? Oh, y'all going to think I'm meddling now. Y'all going to shut me out after this one. But when your thoughts start getting negative, you start listening to negative things. My music changed. My music changed into things that talked about woe is me. Talked about being mad. Talked about other people talked about the haters and the fakers and the please i'm gonna tell you you can sing songs about it all day and guess what they, they ain't going nowhere they still gonna be around you but that's what happened my thoughts then started changing what i would put in me and then what put in me then guess what would change my words would change because that's not the bible say now look at what it says so a man thinketh in his heart so that he is now let's go to another scripture out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. So in other words, it's divinely connected from your thought process to your word process. So your words will be more attractive when your thoughts are more attractive. What do you attract when you think? What goes through your mind? Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, because the Bible says this, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let me say it again. Bringing into captivity every thought. Let me go back to my original statement. I won't tell you that you won't have negative thoughts. I won't tell you you won't have bad thoughts. I won't even tell you don't have mean thoughts. But how long they stay is up to you. Now, let me give you an example. Glad you wore your uniform today, Missy. Thank you. Missy can go out there at the intersection and start waving and telling cars to stop. Oh, let, let me put it better because this is better. Missy can pull somebody over for speeding. They're going to pull over and they're going to listen. I'm a person. So I'm going to pull somebody over for speeding. I'm going to go get over. Get over. You think they're going to listen? Huh? Now, don't tell me. Come on. How many ever had everything right? Your sticker was right. Your tags were right. Your seatbelt was on, and you was doing the speed limit, and you pass a cop, and you still get nervous. Can I preach? You're checking everything. Oh, is my tags right? Do I got my wallet? Everything's going through your mind because what you do is you recognize authority and go, can I answer to it? Because you know if that authority, now, 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 notice this, she's a person like me, but when she puts on the uniform, that is said that the, the town of Tazewell has given her authority to carry out the law. I don't have that uniform. So when it says take every thought captive, does anybody know that's the reason you've got to be in the blood of Jesus? Because the blood of Jesus gives you authority against the devil's thoughts inside your head. Now, he ain't going to pay attention to you, but he does pay attention to the blood. And when the blood speaks and says you cannot stay, he's got to go. Thoughts. They're all over the place. Anybody ever find that your worst thoughts come at night? 
Not by chance, not by reason. I'm going to say this, and I'm going to connect it with your words. Your mind is a garden. Your thoughts are seeds. You're either growing flower or growing weeds. I didn't even know that would rhyme until just now. That's pretty cool. Well, it ain't going to get any better. It's Listen, if that's what you want to attract. But as long as my God is on the throne, my God is good. As long as my God is on the throne, I've got something to rejoice about, to celebrate. And even when the world's falling down, I love what Rebecca says. The fields were empty. The stalls were empty. We've been ravished. The, the, uh, another army come in and wiped us out. We ain't got nothing. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord God of my salvation. And guess what? When he starts rejoicing, God does something. And he will give me hinds feet to walk a little higher of the valley that I'm in. It all started with thoughts. You got to think about it. You got to rejoice. Your thoughts ain't nothing to rejoice about. Guess what you're going to attract? What does your mind attract? Number three. Go to Proverbs chapter 20, verse 21. I mean, 11, I'm sorry. Proverbs 20, verse 11. Somebody say my actions. <laughs> what do my actions attract? There's one time a friend of mine got a Dalmatian. Dalmatian's a pretty good sized dog. And had him on a chain and a few other guys with me. Those guys walked in and they petted him. The Dalmatian was fine. I'm like, oh, let's go ahead. He's a good dog. And I walk in, but my walk's a little different. The reason my walk is a little different is because of past experiences. My first job out of a semester of college, I don't want to say out of college because that's kind of misleading, <laughs> was a repo man. They called it assistant manager of a finance company. Nice title, but what it was was repo man. And I'll never forget, I showed up down in, in somewhere in Buchanan County, and I get out, and I got my briefcase, because that's what I had my papers in to, to, to show that they were behind and whatever. And I got out, and this man walks out on the porch. Porch didn't look all that strong, and he went, sick him. And two dogs come running out under that porch and started grabbing for my leg. One of them got it. And so from that point on, I seen a barking dog. I was fearful. So let me go back to the story. So when I'm walking into Pet the Dalmatian, I already my thoughts, my words, now are my actions. And I was afraid. And guess what that dog did? It bit me. It bit me in the back of the leg. It bit me. And I was like, I thought y'all said it was a nice dog. Now, my buddy, of course, being my buddy, because if you're going to hang around with me, you've got to be able to roast each other. He said, well, he knew that you were a preacher and he knew you tasted like chicken. So, <laughs> No, what he said was, I could tell, Lawrence, when you were walking in that you were afraid. And if the dog feels, sees your actions and feels your fear, they think you mean it harm. Because most of the time when people are afraid, they do crazy things. So just like it, it felt that. So guess what I attracted? I didn't attract the dog that was... For pet me, I attracted the because my actions were different. Look, this is what the Bible says even a child is known by what his doings, whether his work be pure, whether it be right. Even a child from an early age, their actions attract things, their, their actions, the way we walk in this public, the way you are on your job. The way you are when nobody's looking. What are your actions like? Would you want to hang out with you? Would you look at the way you act sometimes and go, I'd hang out with that person. Some of us would probably say, no, I don't think I would. Because their actions change because of what? What we think and how we talk. So that's how we walk. 
When you talk about nothing but negative, think but nothing negative, then you live negative. You ever gave somebody a good compliment and said, gosh, that's good. You did good today. And they went, don't just don't worry about it. I'll mess it up here pretty soon. I done it. God had to correct me on it. Like, what are you? Well, no wonder your actions are what they are because that's what you're attracting. That, that's how you attract things. Never underestimate the power of your actions. Never. Can I say this? With one small gesture, you can change a person's life for better or worse. One small gesture. When's the last time you said, Lord, anoint me to act right? And what I thought. All of us are there. Lord, anoint me to think right. Anoint me to speak right and anoint me to act right. Do you know that that's not air prayer? Air prayer is, Lord, get them for the, what they think about me. Go get them for what they said about me and definitely go get them by the way they treated me. It's the guy on the porch saying, sick them. Tough to tell a God to sick him when there's a God so full of mercy that he wants to love him and he wants you to see him the way he sees him. Amen? He wants you to see what he sees because when you see what he sees, maybe you see a messed up, broken, terrible person, but in your thoughts you go, that is a child that God would die for. That is a child God would walk up a hill for. That is a and whether they ever accept him or not, I'm always going to believe the best for that person. Amen? The best. What do you attract? What's attracted to you? What follows you around? What, 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 what comes to you? What, what are the things that, that happen in your life that you look at? Mike, if you'll put that picture back up. What's amazing about this picture is there's 12 buzzards in a dead tree. Anybody know for every every 12 disciples that want to do good, <laughs> there's 12 that want to do bad. But when I started pumping gas, there was only three. And the one in the middle, you can tell, he's got his wings out. I don't know if that's the man. I don't know if that's the one that, that carries the gang. But as long as he was like that, they were coming from two different directions to land in that tree. I just wonder if that one was the one that says, this is exactly what we're looking for. Right? Does anybody know by their actions, we kind of know what happened without knowing what happened? Anybody see them circling in the sky and what do you say? Something must be dead. <laughs> their actions tell them. We know when they're circling, that they're getting ready to feed on something that's dead. They attracted that. Notice that buzzards ain't flying around a mountain lion that's still living. Anybody get that? Because then they, they're not attracted to life because they have been made in a way that they can't handle life. That's not what they do. They live life, but they can't handle life. So they live like they eat. And, and they live dead. There ain't much about them. Has anybody ever said, that is the best turkey buzzard I've seen? That's beautiful. Have you ever seen such a turkey buzzard? I just now, Has anybody ever took a picture of an eagle? Have you seen an eagle? I was probably the only crazy guy in Tazewell at the Little League field. Probably somebody was wondering, what is he doing? I got my camera, and I'm taking a picture of a dead tree with buzzards in it. It's probably a little weird. Think about it. You take a picture of that, but you're not going by and taking a picture of this. Most people just seen it and never thought nothing about it. But that's how these things live. They live like they can't handle life. Maybe the devil has lied to you and says you can't handle what you're going through. 
Maybe he's lied to you and said that you're living and just because you're breathing don't mean you're living. You may have life, but don't mean you're living. Maybe maybe you're attracted to the next bad thing that's going to happen. Maybe you're attracted to the next thing that's going to make you a failure. I don't know what the devil is telling you and I don't know what's going through your ears. I don't know what's going through your, through your thoughts. I don't know what comes out your mouth. I don't know what, all of your actions, but I know this, that whatever it is, now if you can attract it in the natural, you're also attracting it in the supernatural. Anybody get that? Because dead things attract things that like dead things. Guess what? They don't have to hunt. I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to live a life that attracts life, you better be willing to get in the fight. This whole idea of getting saved and roses are thrown and, and, and life is easy, that is fake, that is false. The battle really begins because the devil used to not even have to do anything because you were dead. But now spiritually, you've been resurrected. You're alive. You're born again. Born again. Not death again. Born again. I've had a birth. Was going to have a death. But got saved out of the death because I got born again. And when I got born again, then something inside of me says, I want life. I want to be attracted to life. I want life to come to me. And the only true life that I am attracted to is Jesus Christ because he is the way, the truth, and the life. Notice that the man that was Gadareans was <laughs> the man the Gadareans that was possessed with devils wasn't trying to attract Jesus. In fact, tried to discourage Jesus, say, had nothing to do with us. Now, after this man was healed, the devils cast out of him. The Bible said that the man was found with Jesus. Clothed and in his right mind. Does anybody get that? The, the, the man didn't go chasing the pigs that once had the devils. He chased the one that got the devils out. Because he's more attracted to how Jesus does me than how the devil did me. Oh my goodness. Yes, we all got stories of, of bad things that happen. We all are going to endure storms we never asked for. Life is nothing more than a spontaneous what is next for you. You have the strongest day you've ever had in your Christian walk, and by tomorrow you could be weak in your faith because of something that came out of nowhere. But can I tell you this? Do not let what you go through change you. Thank God, even if you're going through a bad time, let your thoughts be, God's going to bring me out. Let your words be, God's going to bring me out. And let your walk be, God is going to bring me out. And guess what? You're going to attract it. Think about it. The Bible not say that he inhabits the complaints of the people. When we complain, he shows up stronger. He inhabits praise. I'm going to ask you a tough question. Sunday morning, Mike and them are, are singing. Do you praise because it's on the screen and it's the right thing to do? Or do you praise because he's been so good to you and you can't help but sing. Even if you can't carry a tune in a bucket, you didn't worry about carrying a bucket because God was too busy filling your bushels full of blessings. You didn't care how you sounded in a bucket. You were too busy living in the blessings of the bushel. So you sung. And guess what? That's why people don't think, of, people think parts of a service are so orchestrated. Well, they're going to sing. They're gonna, there's a reason because... <laughs> I don't know about you. <laughs> Glory to God. I want praise to attract God to us. Now, I'm going to tell you, I've heard the word with him and I've heard it without him. I've heard it more of a story and I've heard it as life. If I'm going to hear God's word, I want God to be all up in me because that word becomes a little more powerful when God abides there. If you abide in me, I abide in you. That is what's attracting. My, my, my grandma used to have an old sour apple tree. One of the things I miss the most, for some reason that apple just made me feel, and oh my goodness. And there were times that the good ones would still be on the limb. And somebody would say, well, that's a little too high. 
Just get the ones on the ground. Number one, if they fell off the tree, they already got one strike against them. They got a bruise, right? And I looked at it and went, ah, but I found a way. If I had to climb, if I had to shake it, amen. I can remember one time throwing a football up, hoping to hit it and ready for it to come down. You know why? I wanted the fresh one. I didn't want the one that gave up. I wanted the one that's still hanging on. Oh, glory to God. The reason you're going to fight and scratch and press towards the mark of the high calling, because you know Jesus is the one that won't give up. He's not the one that won't let go. He's not the one that's... Uh, so I need Jesus. I need the power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit that says, don't give up. Don't stop. Press on because something greater is about to happen. And you know what? I'd get that apple. I'd eat that apple. And I'd smile the whole time. But there were times maybe I didn't get that apple. I dealt with the bruised one, and it was mushy. Now, I don't know if that's a real word or not. You may not find it in the dictionary. I like it. I'm going to use it. I don't like mushy apples. I don't like mushy watermelons. I like crispy. So I'd take a bite of mush, and I would go, no, thank you. And I'd throw it back on the ground. Does anybody get what I'm saying? What I put in me. Changed everything about me. As Mike and them come. What do you attract? And what are you attracted to? You attracted to people's opinion because you want everybody to like you? Or are you attracted to God's word that's obedience? He says, yeah. Jesus didn't ask everybody, you think it'd be okay if I hung on the cross? You think this is good? didn't do that. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus wasn't wanting the opinion of man to carry out the will of God. He wanted the will of God so he could be obedient to. He was more attracted to the will of God than the opinions of man. And so that's the reason he would go through some the hardest thing that any of us can ever imagine. He would do it for you because it was the will of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I know what I would like to happen. I know, but you know what? I'm not attracted to me because I know what me does. But I'm attracted to you because I know what you do. And what you do may not look good all the time. And it may not seem good all the time. And it may not feel good all the time. But I've known you enough to know that whatever you put your hand to, whatever you call your will, is going to come out as uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work to the good for them that love the Lord according to his purpose. Does anybody understand? If you would let past change your words, you ought to let God, what he has done in his past, change your words too. That if he did it then, he can do it again. Out of four trees that were there, you can see the one still has some type of leaves on it on the side. There was not one buzzard in that tree. I mean, don't that look, uh, listen, I didn't do this, first of all, out of revelation. I did this because I thought, that looks like a scary movie. <laughs> a dead tree and a buzzard with his wings up, and you're like, oh, no, it's over. But then after I looked at it, I went, wait, they could have picked any tree. They picked this one, and this one's dead. In fact, some of the branches look, I don't even know how it held their weight. I'm thinking, that thing looks like it's one good windstorm away. And if it's still up today, it did good. Because, I mean, it's, it's dead. Think about, what do you attract? Look at your life and find out what you attract. What kind of people are in your life? I don't mean the people who come to you. I'm talking about the people who stay. Because God's going to use us to attract people that are broken, not to be more broken, but to be healed. But if you attract brokenness because you're broken, does anybody know the story? Misery loves company. And can I tell you something else? When you hear somebody talking about somebody else, the reason they talk about somebody else is to make themselves feel better because they feel like they've done better than them. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Anybody understand what the older brother said? I've done good. I've been so good. I ain't left the house. I ain't done nothing. I ain't spent no money. I ain't done. And he's talking that way. And he is in the worst prison that you can be in. 
Wasn't even happy that his brother was home. Wasn't happy that his brother wasn't killed. Wasn't happy that his brother didn't die. His brother came back. His brother that he grew up with, played trucks with, uh, skipped with, did, did whatever together. Now all of a sudden can't get the brother out of his mouth because he couldn't get the brother out of his mind. And because of that, it changed his actions from rejoicing to remorseful by standing outside the party going, I ain't going in there. He did nothing but wrong. Now, the Bible doesn't say, but the father had to come out to him because everybody else was inside celebrating. <laughs> Does anybody get that? See, people celebrate life Sometimes like the older brother, we want to hang out with death. What do you attract? What kind of friends do you attract? What kind of music do you attract? What kind of life do you attract? I'll say that one again. What kind of life do you attract? I'm going to ask you three questions that only you need to answer. Don't look for your neighbor to answer. Don't look for nobody else to answer. I'm going to ask you. What do you talk like? And what does it attract? What do you think like? And what does it attract? And how do you act? And what does it attract? What does it attract? Have you ever found when kids are playing, they attract more kids? Don't they? Kids are like, oh, they're on the slide. I want to go on the slide. And they, they attract one another. Be like a child. They, they, they attract. And they don't care about background. They don't care about what the kid was or how the kid was raised. They just know that kid's having a good time. I always said when you were a kid and you had a Tonka truck, you had 10 good, 10 good friends. Wanted to play with you. Wanted to do construction. Wanted to do, and it didn't matter where they came from or what, but you attracted them because of what was in your life and how you handled it. <laughs> Have you ever seen three-year-olds run up to grown-up conversations because it looks like fun? Oh, they're putting somebody down. I can't wait. There's a reason for that. Kids don't know yet. They only know what to live like. And so they want to be attracted to things that match what they want to live. Anybody get that? They're only attracted to what they match they want to live. It is said that a child will laugh almost 400 times in a week and a grown-up 10. Because as we get older, we start getting a sense of, 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 of doom and gloom and, and the waves of the world and Next thing you know, we're attracting the same thing. Death and life is in the power of your mouth. I hope everybody in this place lives your best life. I hope you live the best way you can. I hope that your life is nothing more than a worship that attracts God to it every day. Attracts God to it every day. I hope your mind attracts God. I, I hope your words attract God. I, I hope your heart attracts God. I hope it does. I hope it does. Because I'm going to tell you, once you start attracting heaven, did not Paul say we can sit in heavenly places? I may not be there, but I can attract it. I, I, can, I can get the sense of the love and the mercy and the grace of what heaven is going to be like. Where do you attract the next bad thing? Well, if it got good, that means it's not going to be long until it gets bad again. What do you attract? When you praise, what do you attract? Do you attract religion? Do you attract the Father? 
What do you attract? How you talk to people? So funny, people say, I can't help it. I had to tell them like it is. They're the same people, if you tell it like it is, will say that you're a terrible, awful person. Because nobody likes it. God is the corrector. God is the adjuster. Love. The greatest thing that you'll attract in your life is love. Because God is love and love is God. Yeah. Lawrence, people have given me every reason not to love again. I'm glad Jesus didn't say that. I'm glad that's not what he attracted. I'm glad that's not what he attracted. Because I gave him every reason not to be saved. I gave him every reason why he shouldn't love me. His love attracts me. Wow. One of the things that I can't wait for. There's a man talking and he said that he went to heaven. He died. He went to heaven. And they said, describe it. He's the only man that I've ever heard described. Everybody else says the city was great. They were gold. This is all he said. He said, I've never, ever felt love like that. And as soon as he said that, tears started rolling out of my eyes. I said, that's it. That's what I want heaven for. I want to be able to walk in a place where there'll never be another hate. But a love like you've never, ever experienced. I'm attracted to that. Would you stand to your feet?